Uh, welcome back. We are about to close out by having, um, we want to hear from the public because we've been spending the day talking to you about different aspects of the clinical care and risk reduction committee work. But we do have some public comments that have um, come in that we want to listen to now. Um, Helen? Real quick, before we turn to public comments. Oh, actually, you're going to go next. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, we wanted to, so this is sad, happy news. Um, but Bruce Fink is going to be retiring at the end of the year and leaving his time, um, with us on Napa. Um, so even though I did not tell Bruce I was going to do this, I just want to make a few comments on behalf of everyone on the advisory council. Um, so Bruce has been with us since our first meeting in September of 2011 over by union station. Um, we've had 54, this is our 54th meeting. Um, and he's been at almost every single one. Um, I remember um, back when my mom used to tune in and watch it. She was like, oh, Bruce Fink is there again. I'm like, he's always here, mom, um, watching us. Um, and, and looking back at the Alzheimer's plan, um, you know, IHS has always been small but mighty. And when this work began, IHS was on as a partner and as a convener on things. And to, so to see the work that has happened at IHS under your leadership and as part of your role in Napa has been amazing to watch. So to just peel back the curtain a little bit to our non-feds, you probably get this by now, but um, it's not like we get the recommendations and we can be like, oh, look, there's a recommendation. We're going to go implement this. So in many cases, the recommendations are implemented over time, slowly by the feds who are around the table and who are watching, taking in your feedback, hearing the themes that are coming up um, and bringing it back to their organizations and moving the work forward slowly but surely. Um, and Bruce is kind of in a unique position because no one, I don't think, has ever made a recommendation focused on your populations. And yet you've gone back, you've heard about dementia care guidelines, you've advocated for this work internally, and it really has moved forward um, in a way that it wouldn't without NAPA, but certainly wouldn't without you. So um, I just want to thank Bruce for all the work that he's done at IHS. And then also for NAPA, um, Bruce also contributes across the board to NAPA, um, even to the point that years ago... I was on my hiatus, but came back and Bruce had done this whole driver diagram to identify what we were still missing in Napa and how we could think about our goals towards our strategies and what needed to be done and where the gaps were. And he comes to each of the subcommittee meetings, not just thinking like, oh, I'm wearing my IHS cap. What do I need to know about my populations? But really thinking about how we can move the work for um, all of the organizations forward and for, for Napa forward. Um, so I just want to thank Bruce for his many years of service. I don't think anyone imagined that we would be here 13 years later um, after that first meeting, especially. Um, but Bruce, to turn it over to you and, and, and thank you for all of that you've done for us and for the populations that you serve. Thank you, Helen. Thanks. That's, uh, that was unexpected and very sweet. Um, this has been such important work. I think that... Um, you know, and it's been impactful work. And I think the impact of NAPA is reflected in, in the reauthorization and in the bipartisan support for the reauthorization. I, I have a, a, just a few reflections, if I can, if I can. Um, I mean, one is to think a little bit about where this impact comes from. And, and I think there's sort of three things that happen as a result of him uh, at NAPA and in the advisory council that um, are a huge part of that impact. One is, is the you all, right? The, the diversity of views that comes into the, this conversation, especially from the non-federal folks who bring, everybody brings their unique perspective. And we need each of those perspectives to figure out, to be able to address the child, this such a complex challenge. And that's really, I think the superpower of this, of the council is to bring together the diverse views um, I think as a result of that, also the, the NAPA, the council has surfaced and, and shed light on aspects of, the, of dementia and populations affected by dementia that wouldn't otherwise, that would have been in the dark, that we wouldn't have seen. And that's been incredibly helpful, I think, along the way. And then um, in, a, all of the, in an important way and in a subtle way, this has just been a forum for conversations and collaboration, uh, conversations that wouldn't have happened and collaborations that wouldn't have occurred if people hadn't been able to come together over the years. And I'm sure that's going to that's that's moving. That's going to move forward. 
you know, from, from an Indian health perspective, um, Napa has put the tailwind at our at wind at our back and given us a tailwind to do the work we needed to do. You know, we get our direction from the tribes and the urban communities we serve. They tell us what the needs are, what their, what their strengths are, what their resources are, how we can help. But, we, um, but the Napa work has um, helped us with our own internal advocacy. It's enabled us to marshal resources. In the beginning, we had no additional resources for this work, and yet, through the collaborations we were able to create through here and through the, the, um, the, the policy tailwind of Napa, we were able to bring resources together to do things that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. And then eventually to get funding, um, really as a result of this, of the advisory council and of Napa to do even more. And, and you, that's what you hear about um, in our quarterly updates, but that wouldn't have happened, I'm convinced without without the work here and the work that you all are doing. Um, you know, the, the, the work, the mood, the, the, the way Napa works changes over time. It's a reflection of leadership and of membership and the particular focus people bring. One thing's been consistent and that's been an atmosphere of collegiality and partnership and, and to do the work. You know, we bring different ideas about the means but a clear, but a common uh, desire to get to the end. And that collegiality um, has been so important. Um, there's also been some tension at times, some creative tension. Um, and I think, you know, from my perspective, that's great. That's important. Um, you know, we, uh, speaking as a federal member to the non-federal members, we love it when you recognize the work we're doing and the progress we're making. We also actually appreciate and need you to challenge us and say it's not enough and it's not fast enough and we need you to do more or we need you to do it. Have you thought about this way or that way? Those questions, those challenges are fine. And I think everybody, all of the federal folks around the table would say the same thing. Most have um, had to deal with more of the challenges than certainly we ha I have. But I think um, it, it, it's, it's part of, the, part of what we do. I, I a, a couple of last thoughts. One is, I think, speaking of challenges, we need to do better. We need to be able to see and show progress in the work. Um, and we've done better in that, I think, on the research mandate um, than we have on the care and services mandate. Um, you know, in on the research mandate, we have met we have metrics that we agree are important metrics of funding levels and of where the funding goes to and we can start to we can see uh, the impact of the funding on the emergence of biomarkers uh, uh, and of treat therapeutics but we've really struggled I think on the care and services not just the steep we sort of feel the progress but we can, it's harder to show the progress and even to know how to measure that and that's one of the places that Council, I think, it's one of the opportunities for the council because um, the council can help us understand what's most important to measure. What do we think is important in terms of care, services, the impact on people's lives, people living with dementia and their care partners? What's important to measure? And how will that, and, and once we can measure it, then we can start to think about what we need to do differently to to, 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 to see change in those measures. I, that's how we can take advantage of the superpower of, the, of, the, uh, of this group, right? The diversity of viewpoint and perspective can help us pick what's important. Um, and that will help us focus on recommendations, right? And we haven't talked about recommendations, but the recommendations can be really, and carry weight and can be important, but they have to be sharply focused. Um, and uh, if we know what we're trying to change, it can help us think about how to focus those recommendations. So I, I really appreciate, thank you for the opportunity to share some of these thoughts. And my last thought is this, um, in the early days of the advisory council, and, and some of you will remember this, there was just a real, there was a palpable, um, 
and, and very real impatience. There was a sense that we, um, a sense of disappointment. Um, we had heard very clearly that the lack of focus on dementia, on making life better for those living with dementia and on making meaningful progress in addressing the, uh, the, the, the underlying pathophysiology and, and bringing therapeutics to bear, that that was not accepted. Um, and things needed to change and they needed to change quickly. Um, there's been a lot of work in the last decade plus, 12, 13 years, and it's been really good work. But we're still at that place, right, where we're not there yet. And I think I, I, um, I think back to that impatience and I think what, a, what an important force that impatience is. And even as we sort of um, appreciate the kind of good work that's gone on. I think it's, it's, it's okay. It, it's, impatience can be a virtue. Uh, I hope we can still be impatient and I'll be uh, following along on the work of the, of the group uh, as, you, as, you, as you move the work forward. So thank you. Thank you. You'll be missed, but also you can always be a public commenter. Um, we welcome, welcome you to do that. I think we have one alumni on our list today too. Um, so we're gonna do um, public comments um, as we usually do. We have a handful of folks online and then one or two people in person. So if you're in person, I, I ask that you join us um, at the podium um, and online, we will uh, enlarge your face on the screen um, and we're gonna go in alphabetical order. So our first uh, comment is from Ron Eppies. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, and then the next comment will be from Anna Fadua. So Ron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Helen. And congratulations, Dr. Fink, on your retirement. Uh, on behalf of the International Association for Indigenous Aging, or IA Squared, I'm here today to highlight the need for dedicated focus to underserved populations at greatest risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Over four years ago, the CDC Healthy Brain Initiative recognized that there were populations of U.S. citizens that were at greater risk for these diseases. These populations included Blacks, Hispanics, those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and the populations we at IA Squared work with on a daily basis, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Hawaiian Natives. This diverse group of people are truly our first Americans. Three organizations were chosen as part of Component B to guide the work directly with these populations. I wish I could tell you that this solved all the problems. It did not. I wish I could say that these populations are now on even footing with Amer white Americans. They are not. What I can tell you is that there has been progress made. For the first Americans, there is now a roadmap for public health agencies to use to support discu discussion about dementia and caregiving in these communities with a second version due to come out soon. There is a social media toolkit to provide guidance to these agencies on best practices when communicating about brain health. Perhaps best of all, there are real conversations taking place among health professionals and families in these Pueblos, tribes, and nations. There is no word for dementia in many indigenous languages. This is just one example of the challenges that we face. And now with the advanced NOFO recently released by the CDC, there are no longer dedicated resource centers for these high risk populations. This is concerning, especially as the recent NAPA reauthorization added a representative from historically underserved populations to the advisory council. The reason there is a need for special focus on these populations was because for decades they had been ignored or at best given lower standards of treatment. A five-year focus does not undo the decades of mistreatment. Removing this focus puts a, these populations right back to where they were five years ago, underserved and ignored. The gains achieved will also soon be forgotten. IA Squared urges this advisory committee in recognition of the work of the National Alzheimer's Project Act and its reauthorization to address this issue in its advice and guidance and continue the momentum that has been started and build upon these resource centers for underserved high-risk populations. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. 
Um, Anna, oh, Anna's in the room, great. And after Anna, we have Matt Janicki, who's online. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here today and for the opportunity to provide a public comment. Uh, my name is Anna Fidua, and I am the Senior Manager of Government Relations at the National Down Syndrome Society, or NDSS. Today, I have the privilege of celebrating alongside you as several critical pieces of legislation have been signed into law. The NAPA Reauthorization Act, of course, as well as the Alzheimer's Investment and Accountability Act. NDSS has been an enthusiastic supporter of both pieces of legislation, but I want to focus my time here today on NAPA, which, as enacted, includes amendments that more explicitly and robustly include the Down syndrome community in the work of this council and subsequently of the National Alzheimer's Plan. As you all are well aware, research supports how devastatingly and disproportionately this disease impacts individuals with Down syndrome. Nonetheless, for years, the Down syndrome community has been excluded from conversations, clinical trials, coverage determinations, and efforts to better understand and fight this terrible disease. The recent work of this council and the passage of the NAPA reauthorization marks a significant evolution in this historical underrepresentation. In September, this council finalized your 2024 recommendations, which included an unprecedented inclusion of the Down syndrome community, who are explicitly mentioned over a dozen times in the final recommendations. We want to thank you so much for that. On the heels of this monumental progress came the passage of the NAPA reauthorization, which includes language that explicitly includes the Down syndrome community, as well as other underserved populations, and creates a seat on the council for, and I quote, one representative from a historically underserved population whose lifetime risk for developing Alzheimer's is markedly higher than that of the other populations. And we know that with a 90% chance of developing Alzheimer's, the Down syndrome community is poised um, to have the highest lifetime risk. And for that reason, we believe a representative from the Down syndrome community is well poised to hold a seat and contribute to the valuable work of this council. We hope that when the time comes to appoint this seat, a representative nominated by the Down syndrome community will be invited to join the council. In closing, the progress this council and the United States Congress has made gives us great hope. My work at NDSS is very personal to me as I have many friends, former classmates, and close family friends with Down syndrome. While I will never truly understand what it is like to be a parent, or a sibling of someone whose life has changed by this disease. I do have the perspective of someone who never wants their childhood best friend or their college classmate who once shone so brightly to have their light dimmed by this disease. Thank you for giving me and our entire community hope that these bright lights can keep shining. While we celebrate this great progress, I think we can all agree there's still, much, still so much work to be done. NDSS and the Down syndrome community look forward to continuing this important work alongside you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Matt Janicki, we'll turn it to you. And then after you will be Stephanie Monroe. Thank you, Helen. My, I'm Matt Janicki. I'm an associate research professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and also the co-president of the National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices, which is a, a national non-for-profit advocating on behalf of people with intellectual disabilities and dementia, as well as their families and caregivers. And I'm speaking today on my one year anniversary of cycling off the council to address two points that I believe that should be considered by the council as it prepares the 2025 update of the national plan. First, on behalf of the NTG, I'd like to extend our congratulations on the passage of the NAFA Reauthorization Act signed by, recently signed by President Biden. We are particularly pleased by the inclusion of the requirement uh, of someone who, who may be serving, representing an underserved population as, as Anna just mentioned. And we hope that the act basically leads to the appointment of someone from the Down Central community to be on the council. Um, the, the first point I want to make is that uh, we want to commend the CMS, CMI, CMMI team for their work on the new guide model program, which you heard a little bit about today. We are pleased that there are some 390 providers across the United States who will be participating in this innovative eight-year program. The NTG recently received the grant from the Special Olympics organization to support training, education, and technical assistance aimed at increasing the inclusion of beneficiaries with intellectual disability living with dementia and their caregivers among participant caseloads. We appreciate the CMS 
guide team's responsiveness to our efforts to develop educational programs for guide navigators, practitioners, and partners. Our goal is to promote the inclusion of beneficiaries with intellectual disabilities and to improve their access to responsive health and social care for dementia. As many adults with Down syndrome are group high risk for Alzheimer's, which often shows the onset of dementia in the early 50s, uh, Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries, we hope the guide participants will consider their needs when seeking beneficiaries and delivering services. We ask the council to prioritize this group with, among younger onset dementia, younger older, excuse me, younger onset dementia in the national plan update recommendations related to the use of guide model services. The second point I want to uh, cover is concerns the recent advanced NOFO, the notice for funding opportunities from CMS, uh, sorry, from CDC, titled Public Health Strategies to Address Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias, issued by CDC for extending the Bold Act's participants and, and programs impact on in the United States. As you may know, the initial phase of this program will end in 2025, including the components A and B and the Bold Centers of Excellence. Over the past four years, as Ron has mentioned, these components have made significant strides in rising, in raising awareness and addressing dementia among underserved populations. And the component beats have been particularly effective in addressing disparities across ethnic and cultural communities, including indigenous Americans and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Given that the NAPA reauthorization specifically alludes to underserved groups, it is disconcerting that CDC's new NOFO does not include continuation funding for initiatives targeting them. While NOFO mentions attending to populations at risk of high incidence of ARD, ADRD, it disaggregates responsibility and subsumes accountability for vague activities addressing these risk populations to other broadly charged components, potentially ensuring the loss of expertise and focus that has prevailed during the current funding period. While the Council does not set policy for federal partners, we ask that the Council address this omission in any statements or guidance to the CDC in advocating for continued inclusion of support for these populations. The POD program has been a key partner to the Council's work, and we hope that the CDC reconsiders the NOFO structure and reinstitutes funding for these much needed efforts that would lead to the reduced disparities in dementia awareness and services for these populations at risk of dementia. Thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts and we look forward to the council's continued support for the inclusion of issues related to the people with intellectual disabilities and Down syndrome in the national plan. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, our next comment will be from Stephanie Monroe, and then our final comment will be from Mary Richards. Stephanie, the floor is yours. Love that I can see over it. So on behalf of Us Against Alzheimer's, I'm here today to comment on the need to focus on populations that are at greatest risk for developing Alzheimer's. Diverse populations in minoritized communities do matter. They matter a lot, and they certainly need to matter more in America. We know too well that these communities have been left behind, left out, unincluded, and ignored when it comes to achieving health equity. The National Alzheimer's Project Act called this out and demanded a change, of course. Prevention of Alzheimer's disease is of national importance, not just to our medical payment system, but to the millions of people living with this disease, their families, and their caregivers, who experience a significant challenge and losses that come from Alzheimer's. I know because besides working in the Alzheimer's space for more than 13 years, I'm also one of the 11 million family members providing care for my dad, my 87-year-old father, and two other close relatives with dementia. I view it as a blessing to be able to provide that care for my loved ones, but the challenges are real and increasingly, I believe, becoming unnecessary. We know that prevention and risk reduction work. It's an individual responsibility, yes, a community responsibility, yes, but also a governmental imperative. We have to be, move beyond supporting and developing a sick care system to a health care system and maybe even a wellness system. And we can do it if we are all pulling in the same direction and not stop until we reach the goal. I can say that because I ended some time ago about a 30 year um, stint on Capitol Hill, um, 
on the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. And one of our most favorite, favorite things to do was to employ the government and state governments to coordinate, collaborate, and consolidate. We love those words, right? Of course, where I sat, the help committee never talked to the finance committee. So I'm like, ha, huh, proof's not exactly in the pudding, but it is really a governmental imperative. It's a way for us to reach more people more effectively, to take the benefit and build on what we know is happening at HRSA and at CDC and at NIH, um, doing different things, but doing them in a way that affects the same people. If we pull together, I think we really can make a difference when it comes to health disparities. We know that the adoption of goal six um, to reduce risk factors for ADRD um, was significant. I'm pleased that Us Against Alzheimer's helped lead this charge. And we are determined to see it accomplished, starting with those on the front lines. Blacks are at least twice as likely, Hispanic Americans at least one and a half times as likely to develop Alzheimer's and dementia as non-Hispanic whites. This logically means we must double our focus and intentionality toward these, in, these populations. That's what health equity is. It's not giving more to the same populations. It's not doing different to the same populations. It's doing exactly what populations need in the communities, making sure they receive the information, have opportunities to implement the information, and that the infrastructure around them is brought to them to support that. One of the things Us Against Alzheimer's has really excelled at this year is our ability to reach what we say, I won't say hard to reach, hardly reached populations. We know how to do it. We've demonstrated it. We know we've got great messages thanks to the great work that Napa Council has done through the other members here. We just need some more time to get it out there and to see if we can uh, change um, delivering messages into behavior. We need to know, can we modify behavior and measure that so that we can be very effective in accomplishing goal six? So we were quite dismayed to, to learn that the CDC forecasted notice of funding opportunity left out this precious focus on often overlooked populations, Black, Latino, Indigenous, and those with disabilities. We know that it's not a, stipe, a step in the right direction we frankly don't believe that that was the intent. And so we are working with CDC to um, re-articulate its commitment to these important conversations as our nation continues to brown and to age. We look forward to another decade of Napa and hopefully an effort to refine and update our national goals. We at Us Against Alzheimer's urge the, the council to redouble its efforts to focus on people who need it the most people who have historically been overlooked, underserved, and to do so in both our planning and our funding. Thank you. Thank and you, I Stephanie. I don't think I said, did I say who I want? Stephanie Monroe, Vice President of Us Against Alzheimer's. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Mary Richards, over to you. Thank you, Helen. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for a dynamic meeting today. Um, Bruce, uh, congratulations on your retirement. And I will tell you, I'm I'm back doing Alzheimer's work after about 10 years working on coalitions um, and disability uh, groups that think about uh, diabetes, hypertension, peripheral artery, artery disease, and some other issues that have come up a number of times today. But um, you're always welcome back to think uh, so clearly and smartly about how to overcome Alzheimer's disease, especially for the populations that you've served. Um, I am the co-chair of a new project called The Heart of the Solution. It's a campaign that integrates vascular health and inflammation into the, our thinking around Alzheimer's um, and dementia prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and care. As we've heard from a number of speakers today, uh, hypertension, stroke, uh, diabetes, these are all both risk factors and coexisting conditions that um, many people in our population are experiencing. And having two or more risk factors like blood, high blood pressure or diabetes increases the risk of dementia by at least threefold. Um, it's been really interesting to hear. It's also really exciting to come back at a time when we've just had the reauthorization of the National Alzheimer's Project Act, which I was so happy to work on years ago. And I'm so pleased to see the level of 
um, research, but also the goal is to make Alzheimer's a priority. So establishing those goals, interrogating those gaps, assessing the areas of need based on a deep knowledge and commitment to a community that so deserves our focus, and then driving resources to improve outcomes for the community um, has been palpable as, a, as an interested observer for the past several years. I feel like I'm coming back in an era of, of uh, um, wonderful discovery around both biomarkers and diagnosis and treatment, understanding prevention and risk factors. And it's also um, a time when we can identify that um, things like it was wonderful to hear about health systems work that needs to happen rapidly right now so that people can appropriately access uh, the care that is available and that is appropriate uh, for, for folks who may be seeking it. Um, we also know more shots on goal are needed. And so we, as we think about a multifactorial disease that requires a multifactorial approach, including interventions for all contributors to Alzheimer's disease, including inflammation and vascular health, um, we are excited at the heart of the solution to be partnering with existing leaders already in this space. I think Napa has shown how, and the, the council itself has shown how quickly and how thoughtfully we can tackle large system scale problems when we um, work together. And so I am delighted to um, be here with you today and to hear all of the excellent work that's going on. We look forward to partnering with leading organizations who are experts in Alzheimer's and dementia, including folks who are focused on care research, caregiving, folks with lived experience. And I was really excited to hear from ACL about thinking clearly about services and supports and those wraparound um, efforts that can help people live the life they most want to live. Um, we are excited to hasten improvements in understanding risk factors, prevention, treatment, and better outcomes through a united effort. Um, and I look forward to collaborating uh, with Helen and your team and HHS, all of our council members and, the, uh, and participating with this incredibly effective group of organizations um, to keep moving forward and improving the lives of millions of Americans, both living with Alzheimer's disease and all of us who are in the families who are also profoundly affected by a condition that we really hope to effectively treat and prevent in the near future. So thanks so much for having me. I want to thank everybody for joining us today online and in person. This has been quite a, a thorough uh, discussion. Let me give you the heads up on our next two meetings. One is January the 13th, where we'll be looking at long-term services and support. And then April 28th, where it will be our, our research um, group. The federal updates today were replete with resources that really address the NAPA recommendations we've been having over time, and I appreciate and will look up that MMWR about the caregivers that I want that I want to make sure I understand more about that. We, that came up in one of our committee meetings recently. The importance of having infrastructure in place to be able to do data sharing, the value of using technology to fill in some of these gaps, because we will never have enough people and trained people to do that seeing how we can use decision support tools that will allow us to do appropriate anticipatory guidance to the families as they are living um, through this period of their life. Understanding that there are more systems that can be developed, not just guide, but how we can do more with other ones that are um, budding out there. But I go back to listening to what Bruce told us. We have the diversity of views at the table, and we all have a mic so we can listen to each other and build upon that. This collaboration can bring forth more changes, even though our siloed payment system has been one of the challenges. It doesn't have to stop us. When we look at the wealth of things that are happening in Georgia and in Wisconsin, we know that all of it can be done. Thank you all for being here today, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.